is probably the, the most significant military uh, example of. Uh, and that kind of thing has been taken for granted for the seven decades, plus decades uh, since the war. Now there's a lot of wonder uh, here in Europe as to what that alliance has as a, as a future as well as a past. What's also interesting about the, you see different types of veterans who have come here over the years. There have, a lot of them went home, as Rob says, and, and didn't want to talk about it, didn't tell their families. Some of them were school teachers, history teachers that never explained their role, uh, the role that they had here. Uh, a lot of guys like that have started coming back over the last two or three years. Yeah. As they've hit their 70s, 80s, and 90s, yeah. it's as if they want to acquaint their families their children, their grandchildren, yeah. in many cases, as to not just what what granddad did here, but why it mattered what granddad did right. here. And that's something you hear them say. I've about. been really struck by how many of the of the veterans who are here are here for the first time. Yeah, I mean, in their 90s and made extraordinary journeys to get here, obviously, at, at that age. And and to your point, it is something that, that for a long time they were very uncomfortable talking about. But... Um, we saw a secretary, a former Secretary of State John Kerry here. There, there are a, a lot of uh, dignitaries from the United States. The ceremony will begin with an, an invocation, um, and then we will hear remarks uh, from uh, French President Emmanuel Macron, who will also uh, present the Legion of Honor to five American veterans. Uh, and then President Trump will speak uh, as well. He's expected to speak for about 25 minutes. This is, uh, for any American president, this is a, a really solemn and, and special ceremony to be a part of, Rob, isn't it? For so many of us, depending on how old you are, of course, uh, it was President Reagan's visit uh, to uh, a little bit up the coast here to yeah. Point to Hawk in the f uh, 40th anniversary in 1984. Gave what I thought was one of the most magnificent speeches of his career. I know I'm not alone in that, but yeah. you certainly still have people talking about it here. Actually, people brought it up as we were walking through here yesterday. We're on a cruise here in Normandy. The National World War II Museum's brought a couple of ships full of visitors and veterans, and mm -hmm. uh, it's all that was being talked about over the last couple of days. So That's many people remember where they were when that speech was given. This is a chance to to act presidential, to to represent the country in a in a really deep and moving way, and I think you know every president should and probably will take advantage of it. This, talk to me uh, again, Rob, about, about when we talk about the scope of this invasion, and that's a point that you've made, uh, the planning for this, uh, particularly considering the technology at the time, was really extraordinary. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we're, we're talking about analog technology, the heart of that era. There, there are no digits really being in, uh, coming into play here. It was well over a year, almost two years in the making. Um, the size of it, the fact that it was, you know, we say amphibious, uh, Anthony, mm -hmm. but really I, I like triphibious. That is, you're yeah. landing from the sea, you're, you're landing from the air. Yeah, it, it, it's happening so in all three, uh, all three domains. And um, the absolute complexity, of course, means that you've ratcheted up the number of things that can go wrong. And this is why I think you have a supreme commander mm -hmm. who writes a note the night before congratulating the troops and, you know, urging them on to victory and then also writes a second note just in case things go wrong and says, you know, the fault was mine alone. So I think uh, when I look at D-Day, when I look at Operation Overlord, I look at size and complexity. Yeah, I mean, and the, one of the things that strikes me every time I come here is the sheer scope of what we're talking about. A 50 mile stretch of beach, 150,000 men. You can see the cemetery uh, behind us and what the cost was. Um, it, it seems almost mir miraculous that it worked. It's, um, you know, I'll go out on a bit of a limb. Uh, it's unlikely anything of this scale will ever be done again in quite this same way. But once again, if you see the planning maps and if you see the things that the planners had to be worried about, I think you really do get a sense that this was a one-shot gamble. If it doesn't work, it's not yeah. like you're going to pull the trigger again anytime soon. But but the generals on the morning were, were convinced that... Well, I think they, you know, they'd done all they could. Um, yeah. uh, it was now in the hands of the fates or gods or however you, you like to put it. I think they knew that they had done all that was humanly possible to ensure the success of this venture. Is it true that, that basically their view at the time was, if we don't do this, we may not win the war in Europe? If we don't do this, um, the war will go on a lot, lot longer. And the war has become bloodier and bloodier. Every yeah. month it went on was, was another human disaster. So if we don't do this, the end of the war is no longer in sight. I think I'd put it that way. Well, there's also also the, the, the Russian-Soviet question. Is there yeah. much pressure to 
open that Western Front and yeah. keep Stalin on. You were basically dividing the, the, the German army with this invasion. And you, you're putting, uh, placing the German army in a conundrum it can't solve, that is it has to fight in two mm. directions at once. It's having enough trouble fighting the Soviets all by, uh, all by themselves, but that's really the two-front war and I think that's what we're after here. Mm -hmm. You're looking at the crowd there, which stretches up the middle of the cemetery between uh, two rows of trees that lead to the memorial uh, at one end of the cemetery, um, where, uh, as you can see there, there are the, you can see the veterans in a big screen that's been set up. Um, this applause is for those veterans. Um, there are about 50 American veterans who've made the journey. I think we're responsible, Anthony, for are maybe you, about 25 of them. Are you I, about I think 25? I have to look at the exact uh, count, yes. We've had two ships, and they've been spread between the two ships. And you said rock star, you know. They're just they're getting one standing low after the other, and I'm glad to see another one here. Yeah. And it's, it's from what I've seen, they've, they've clearly enjoyed it. I mean. They've enjoyed it. They've yeah. enjoyed getting together. They talk to each other like 18-year-old boys, which is what they were when they're 19-year-old yeah. boys, which is what they were when they yeah. invaded these beaches. It's an extraordinary bond having experienced that because very few other people know what, what it was like. Shakespeare said it best, the band of brothers. You know, yeah. that's what it's all about. Yeah. There are in all about 100 veterans uh, here, we are told. Um, Less than half a million survived from World War II, Rob, is that right? So 16 million in the uniform, less than half a million. Uh, the Veterans Administration has statistics of how many are passing away each day. You can almost do an actuarial table of it's, when the generation will be will It's be about gone. 350 a day, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Something, something along those lines. Right. And so, you know, we just, uh, that's why this 75th was so crucial to get as many of them out here as we could. Mm -hmm. What was the response when you reached out? Oh, almost all. It was uh, unanimous. Uh, anyone who could travel wished to travel. You know, men in their uh, in their mid 90s, there are health problems and, and issues yeah, that arise course. with this kind of travel, even this kind of day. But uh, we we had very few people who said they weren't interested. Mm -hmm. There's a look at the crowd there that stretches across the cemetery. The platform is in the shape of a star at the request of the White House, and uh, that's where President Trump will speak. There's <laughs> look at. The faces. Airborne, airborne yeah. trooper there. Yeah, an airborne paratrooper, yeah. The paratroopers had a very important job, didn't they, Rob? We tend to think of the landing in Normandy, and we tend to think of amphibious, that is, you know, getting off the boats. But there already were Americans in Normandy when those troops landed from the boats, and they were the airborne, the, you know, very early in the morning of, of June 6th. And they're in the middle of an unknown situation, mm -hmm. dark. They don't know where the enemy is. They're heroes. And even the pathfinders before them, I've always been fascinated by the guys who went in on their own to put up the beacons that the paratroopers then followed in, or the guys who swam in on their own to, to clear mines for the landing craft. To you come literally in. are on your own. You're fighting the entire German army by yourself, is, is I'm sure how it feels. Right. Uh, we want to go to uh, our Paula Reed, who's been traveling with President Trump. Uh, and is going to join us now. Paula, what can we expect from President Trump in his speech this morning? Well, Anthony, the challenge for President Trump is how does an America first leader honor the lesson of Normandy, which is that we need our allies. We have obtained an advanced copy of the president's prepared remarks, and unlike previous U.S. presidents, he will not embrace those international alliances that emerged following the Second World War. He has, of course, dismissed NATO as a, quote, ripoff and accused it of using the U.S. as a piggy bank. But we did notice that he will acknowledge our, quote, cherished alliance with our friends and partners and our, quote, unbreakable bond forged here at Normandy. Among the leaders who will be at the ceremony with President Trump, Prime Minister Theresa May. Both she and Queen Elizabeth used the president's visit to London earlier this week to try to emphasize the importance of these alliances to President Trump. But he campaigned on a promise to sort of disrupt this global order that emerged following the Second World War. He has publicly sparred with many of the leaders who will be here today and imposed tariffs on the EU, Canada. He's threatening to do the same, of course, with Mexico. Later today, he will meet with French President Emmanuel Macron. Uh, those two gentlemen, they had a relationship that started off okay, but has deteriorated as they have publicly sparred over Iran, climate change, and Huawei. It's unlikely that that testy relationship will be mended even by today's celebration of our shared history. Anthony? Paula Reed, thank you, Paula. 
Uh, we were talking about the paratroopers a moment ago. Uh, Mark uh, Phillips, you, you had an amazing story yesterday with one of the veterans who, who didn't just come back, he, he jumped back. The, the hero of Carantai, a 97-year-old uh, paratrooper who had jumped in with the 101st uh, on the eve of the, uh, of the invasion. And uh, he has, back in the States, mm -hmm. maintained his what is it, parachuting ticket. He's kept jumping in commemorative jumps over the years. And yes, he jumped back in, not quite to the very same field where he had landed uh, 75 years ago, but close enough. And the, what do you know, the whole town was out there, there to greet him. He's the, uh, yeah. the, the hero who arrived from the skies oh. again. Um, Rob, you, you were talking about the, the bond that, that, uh, that these soldiers have. One of the things that, uh, that I've found whenever I talk to them um, is their insistence that they not be called heroes. We hear it again and again, Anthony. Um, I had a job to do, or sometimes even more uh, indefinite, there was a job to be done. You sometimes hear yeah. them say this all the time. Yeah. I think of that generation coming out of the Depression when no one had a job, when jobs were hard to come by. And, yeah. and I, I hear that echoed when I listen to veterans talk about their role in World War II. Something I had to do, I was given a mission, I was given a job. Yeah. Um, we call them heroes, and, and it's one word uh, you'll almost never hear them call themselves, which is, I think, appropriate. Right. The, 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 the truth is a lot of them carried home some very difficult memories that were hard to live with, and they don't talk about it much. Occasionally they will, but it, it's particularly what happened here. I, I think in the United States in particular, we, we tended to look at post-traumatic stress as a, a kind of Vietnam thing. Yeah. Well, we, we now know today it's been around as long as men have been in fighting situations, yeah, and of course. certainly men came home from World War II feeling the effects of what they had done, carrying the memories. You can look at uh, alcoholism statistics, mm -hmm. broken marriages. So it's a, we, there, there should be no real happy talk about the experience. It's a rough one, and, and uh, they showed it. Um, we, should, uh, we should say the, the ceremony is probably running a few minutes behind at the moment, uh, starting. Uh, President Trump, uh, from what I can see on French television, is in the midst of an interview. Uh, and we're also waiting for pre uh, French President Macron but um, it will begin here very shortly. Uh, this day, which, which has been marked you know, with, with some very significant anniversaries, obviously, do you think with, with, as we lose these veterans, do you think we'll lo lose the sense of its significance? I think those of us who care have a real responsibility. Yeah. And I mean museums like my own, I mean collectors, authors, filmmakers. I, I think we need to really see to it that, that the memories of this war are, are never lost. It was too big and the sacrifice was too great. Yeah. So you, you're, you're raising the possibility of a danger and, and I see it and I hope, I hope we're wrong. Because it's, it's one thing I've really been struck by as we've, as we've met with veterans in the last couple of days when they're present, they really bring this to life in a way that, that you know, storytelling just can't. It's impossible to be in the presence of a veteran. Sometimes I say, oh, they tell us interesting stories, anecdotes, you learn things. But really, it's basking in their presence. It just ratchets up the intensity of the historical experience. You suddenly feel like you're living the experience as opposed to reading about it. Yeah. Mark, what's the, the most striking thing you've seen with veterans this time around? The, following on that point, one of the, uh, the things that veterans have often done here is be brought into French schools mm -hmm. uh, to talk to French school children and be questioned by French school children. They, now, the, these aren't kids who don't know what happened here. Mm -hmm. the, the, the door landed on their, the war ended on their front, uh, front doorstep. And these guys bring history in the flesh to them mm -hmm. uh, when they come into the classroom and it's it's uh, this is not an area of the world where there's any sense of uh, oh a forgetfulness about uh, exactly w what uh, took place here there's still a very enduring sense of gratitude and there's a very deliberate attempt on the part of certainly the education boards and so on to uh, to keep uh, the memory alive especially as we get to the point now where that history in the flesh is going to cease to exist, certainly in the numbers that it has uh, up until now. They've done a really, a really good job here uh, over the years of integrating the veterans, not just to come here and come to this sacred American ground where yeah. so many American war dead lay, uh, but to also take them through the countryside, both uh, to, to the surrounding area, both to show uh, the people that these were, you know, real people came from across the seas to, uh, to liberate them. Um, but also, it's, you hear the veterans say, this is what we fought for. Yeah. You know, 
uh, I remember the last time it was quite a moving scene where uh, a veteran who had landed on Utah Beach uh, dro drove his tank onto Utah Beach and he said didn't stay for long, <laughs> kept going. Um, and he was brought into a high school um, just uh, in a town uh, up the road here and he was pretty well moved to tears that, yeah. that uh, here, here were these, you know, healthy, fresh, clean, bright, free uh, French high school students, yeah. um, which of course uh, he would take credit for having uh, contributed to the, their happy state of affairs, but, uh, but they still thank him for that. The, the, the sense of gratitude here is still palpable. I mean, every time I've come back, it doesn't, it hasn't faded in the least. And what happened here is celebrated on the sides of buildings. And one of the things that I was struck by again, I've seen it before, but are all the, uh, on major anniversaries, all the vintage, you know, military vehicles that flood back into this region. There are whole convoys of them driving around by people from all over Europe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not quite sure. I think they're GIs and they're Speak to you in Flemish. <laughs> the, uh, the military reenacting community is strong and vibrant here in Western Europe. You mentioned Flemish. I was just about to say the Netherlands. Yeah. We're just in Amsterdam, and, and the, the reenactor community there is really on fire for D-Day 75. No, we were walking down Omaha Beach uh, yesterday, and, and two Jeeps came, you know, thundering down. Mm. And it's, it's, uh, it can be quite startling at times, yeah. actually. These narrow country roads as well, but that's exactly what it was like in June of 44. And that's, that's why the reenactors are, are really enjoying their day right now. We're looking at uh, some of the guns that will be part of the 21 gun salute uh, at, towards the end of the ceremony. Um, that is something when you drive around the, 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 the narrow small roads in this area, you really get an appreciation for how difficult it must have been for the troops coming ashore to make sense of where they were and where they needed to go. The age before GPS, no one was pulling out their phones. Yeah. Narrow country lane in the middle of the night in a rural portion of France. It's not the easiest place to fight modern war. And, and led to the, the whole hedgerow wars uh, along here. These, these are natural lines of defense. You, yep. never, you didn't know who was behind that hedge. Yep. Um, and that slowed the, uh, the Allied advance considerably in the month that followed. Which is why, I mean, we were talking to a veteran yesterday who literally said uh, it, was, it was, you know, hedgerow to hedgerow, town to town. Mm. That's, that's how we advanced. And, and, and how, how quickly did that progress, Rob? Well, not as quickly as Allied planners wanted no. it to progress, Anthony. That's one thing for sure. The landing on June 6th, um, by middle of July, troops are still barely beyond their original landing positions. And people are starting to ask questions about why isn't this going faster? But it wasn't going faster because the terrain and the Germans, you know, those are the two factors you usually have to take into account. Yeah, French President Emmanuel Macron and his wife Brigitte arriving uh, at the cemetery, the American cemetery. This is actually... American ground, isn't it? It's technically, I think, still in under French territoriality. That is, this is it's not considered American territory, and yet it is administered by the American Battlefield and Monuments Commission. So uh, we have administrative, I guess, prerogatives over this piece of ground we're standing on. This cemetery, um, which is, as I understand it, the second most, most visited American military cemetery in the world after Arlington, correct? It would make complete sense to me, and, and I think that makes complete sense when you look at the importance of the two spots. Yeah, there are over a million visitors a year. And uh, it, it's actually, it was, I believe, dedicated in 1956. Yes. 1956, a number of smaller temporary or provisional cemeteries across Western Europe were combined. And this was, you know, this was the main one here in Western Europe. You know, it's absolutely beautiful. I hope folks at home are going to be getting that as, yeah. they, as they look at it. And if you haven't seen it as an American, maybe it's something you ought to see. You know, you, you hate to tell people what to do with their spare time. Right. There's, of course, we're, sorry, just to just, uh, I just want to say yeah. the French president uh, greeting there with uh, mm -hmm. uh, President Trump. Mark, go ahead. Just sorry. worth mentioning as well, they, the more than 9,000 people. These, these are not casualties just of the invasion, but yeah. of the whole Normandy campaign, yeah. which proved to be far more difficult and far more time consuming and far more consuming of lives and resources uh, than had been had been planned yeah. for. 9,380 yeah. buried in this cemetery, mm. among them four women, 33 pairs of brothers, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. But this is only one third, actually, about a third of the, of the overall um, a number of soldiers we lost in the Battle of Normandy. Most of the most were repatriated. Right. If if you look at the total number of casualties that the, the U.S. military took in the fighting across Western Europe, in the in the Battle for Normandy alone, so from the landing to a couple months forward, it's over. Yeah. 
150,000 or 200,000. I mean, the numbers really boggle the imagination. Mm -hmm. It was August before they got to Paris, correct? Yes, uh, Paris would be liberated in late August, which, you know, was supposed to be sort of, the, that would be the end of the first stage of the campaign, and it took mm -hmm. a lot longer than anyone had anticipated. Was that, the, was, what, was the, what was the main goal when, when, they, when they sent all those ships uh, overnight on, on, uh, before June 6th? What was, the, what was the main objective? The main goal was to establish a, a, a beachhead at five separate beaches, which would then fight their way forward and unite into one gigantic beachhead. And so that did not happen on D-Day, be largely because of the difficulties here at Omaha. The troops at Omaha barely got ashore, and so there was a little nervousness on the part of the Allied planners in that you had well-established beachheads to, to west and east, and then a, a kind of... Uh, in the middle, you had a hole. It was like a donut. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Omaha needed to fight its way forward so that you could have a nice cohesive lodgement and then use that to build up and then to break out strike towards germany right you're watching president trump and president macron going down the honor cordon on their way to the ceremony which will begin shortly Paula was mentioning earlier, it's been interesting watching the evolution of the relationship yes. between these two men, and I think we'll see another chapter uh, in, that, uh, in that today. Uh, Macron, of course, being a champion of European unity and the, uh, Euro the whole European project, and uh, President Trump uh, preferring to deal with individual countries rather than dealing with the European collective, and it's uh, that and tariffs and other issues have have strained the relationship of a wonderful see uh, an enduring handshake uh, today <laughs> yes. and, and who let's go first <laughs> i like to think the bonds between the united states and france are, are too deep that they run too deep to ever really be fundamentally disturbed by a single individual uh, charles de gaulle in the 1960s wasn't exactly good for no. u.s french relations no. either no, that was very true. problematic but this relationship goes back to the Revolutionary War. The Revolutionary War would not have been won without French America, assistance. America's so, first ally. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it goes w w way back, and I have a feeling it's going, going to endure into the future. Maybe I'm an optimist. Well, you've, I mean, as we've talked about, you've, you do feel it enduring among certainly people in this area where, where, uh, where, that, where that gratitude runs, runs deep and strong, and, uh, and they have been you know, incredibly welcoming here to, uh, to everyone who's come back, whether they're veterans or... Uh, or just tourists who are here for for the occasion, and there are a lot of those. There are a lot of those. Even in off years, I came in an off year about seven or eight years ago mm. uh, with a veteran, and uh, again there were all many vintage vehicles out and and lots of people who just wanted to be here for an anniversary. Well, it's history, but it's it's also an industry. The, yeah, which is true. Yes, the, this is. Uh, <laughs> You know, there's a lot to see around here, and people come to see it, and it's a, it's a wonderful place to visit, aside from the fact uh, that it's so historic. And it's interesting, because if you go to some of the, the farms or, or how, small houses around here, they still pull out uh, artifacts from the fields, mm. um, you know, on a regular basis. You know, old uh, unexploded grenades, even things like that. A metal detector's paradise here. Yeah. I led a, a <laughs> cadet yes. tour in 2009 uh, of Normandy, and it wasn't even at the D-Day anniversary. Yeah. And everywhere we took these West Point cadets, you know, everywhere in Normandy, the small town, the mayor came out, greeted us. We had to see the museum. We had to watch the movie in the museum. We were we were treated to drinks and, and, and meals. And that, to me, was a real eye-opener. Yeah. If you ever want to travel, travel in the presence of 15 West Point cadets. <laughs> You'd be surprised at the treatment you get. The two presidents uh, greeting, greeting the veterans there, as you can see. Uh, it's interesting. There, there are a lot of um, American soldiers here today. Uh, and this is a this is a pretty but you can tell it's a very special moment for them because they see their own history and and what they're part of the continuity of if you're a member of a, any military establishment you have to have a sense of history you have to know who your heroes are what your decisive moments were and let me tell you my contact is mainly as a civilian with the US Army I've taught at West Point I have contacts within the army and they still look back to this day and the campaign that followed as the kind of the forge mm -hmm. uh, that made them what they are today. No matter whether you're a young PFC right now or you're already at the top of the command chain, D-Day's huge. It's looking like a pretty friendly encounter, arms yeah, on yeah. shoulders. And, uh, uh, President Macron will decorate us. I think you mentioned earlier uh, five Americans today. It's a standard kind of feature at these things yeah. where Americans re receive uh, the Légion d'honneur, the highest uh, French civilian oh, award yeah. uh, for their 
uh, contribution to the liberation uh, effort here. And uh, this is uh, this is kind of military history and political theater happening before before our eyes there. Yeah, one of the one of the f five who will be uh, who will be decorated was uh, we had on CBS this morning yesterday, Stan mm. Friday, right. who arrived on Utah Beach. He was uh, we we weren't allowed to announce it yet because it wasn't official, but he was very excited about it. So th these are uh, supposed to be you know, solemn, formal events, but often these spontaneous rounds of uh, applause break out, uh, which is always, always interesting to see. <laughs> Not sure what the president just held up there. Please remain standing for the posting of the colors, the playing of the French and U.S. national anthem. Veuillez rester debout pour le lever des couleurs, les hymnes nationaux de la France et des États-Unis et l'invocation. We're awaiting the posting of the colors here and first the French national anthem, the Marseillaise. This is the first ceremony of this kind for both of these presidents. This is sort of the baptism of fire. <laughs> That's the memorial. Well, there it is, the memorial that, um, which is an ex extraordinary uh, place to visit because you see the entire, uh, it's covered today uh, with a special covering for this ceremony. But you see the entire the entire battle mapped out on those walls. So it, it, it links the sacrifice to the actual battle, which I, that's why I think it's a particularly effective monument. French national anthem, the Mar La Marseillaise, will be followed by the American.
Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the invocation offered by the U.S. Army Europe Command Chaplain, Colonel Timothy Mallard. Mesdames et Messieurs, veuillez rester debout pour la prière donnée par l'aumônier militaire en chef des forces armées américaines stationnées en Europe, le colonel Timothy Mala. Almighty God, Lord of hosts, sacred to us is the memory of our fallen and the sacrifices of our veterans on these waters, shores, fields, and skies. And thus we humbly ask for your holy presence here today in this ceremony. From many nations, their sacrifice poured out in blood, courage, and even death to secure liberty for your enslaved children and to smash tyranny remains our moral touchstone. For so great an act of love, we pray that you will grant them eternal peace and their families lasting comfort. By their courage on D-Day and afterwards, we also pray that you will challenge us to love freedom more than comfort, privilege, or even life itself. And that without thought of cost or reward, we also will recommit ourselves to defend life, liberty, and the pursuit of the common good, no matter the cost. Though we are resolute in our request, O oh God, we know we cannot achieve this without your divine blessing and guidance. And so lead us as our shepherd, even if it be again, through the valley of the shadow of death, towards the green pastures of peaceful freedom. All this we ask, O Father of mercy, in thy holy name, amen. President and Ms. Macron, President and Ms. Trump, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Normandy American Cemetery and Memorial in Colville-sur-Mer for the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the D-Day landings on 6 June 1944. Today we honor and commemorate the 9,388 interred here the 1,557 names on the wall of the missing, and all of our World War II veterans. Monsieur le Président, Madame Macron, Monsieur le Président, Madame Trump, Mesdames et Messieurs les représentants officiels, Mesdames et Messieurs, bienvenue au cimetière américain de Normandie de Colville-sur-Mer pour la commémoration du 75e anniversaire du débarquement du jour J le 6 juin 1944. Aujourd'hui, nous rendons hommage aux 9 388 soldats qui reposent en ce lieu, aux 1 557 disparus honorés sur le mur des disparus, ainsi qu'à tous les combattants de la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Mesdames et messieurs, veuillez vous asseoir. Ladies and gentlemen, and gentlemen the Secretary of the American Battle Monuments Commission, William Matz. Mesdames et Messieurs, le secrétaire de la Commission des Monuments de Guerre, William Matz. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our commemoration ceremony of the Normandy landings. And it is indeed an honor for me to be with you today on these sacred grounds of the Normandy American Cemetery to celebrate the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And we extend a particularly warm welcome to President of the French Republic, Emmanuel Macron, and his wife, Bridget Macron. And to our President and Commander-in-Chief, Donald J. Trump, and First Lady, Melania Trump.
to our many distinguished government and military leaders, and to the families of our honored dead who traveled to these now peaceful and hallowed grounds to bear witness to the valor and the sacrifice of their family heroes resting here. To the and to the more than 160 World War II veterans seated herein on this stage who need no reminders of the horrors of war and who remember well their comrades who never came home. And folks, a very special, special welcome to the D-Day veterans present today, approximately 35, who 75 years ago on Omaha and Utah beaches and in nearby landing fields took the first treacherous steps towards liberation as a watchful world anxiously awaited word of their fate. The mission of the American Battle Monuments Commission, folks, is to commemorate and honor the service and sacrifice of United States Armed Forces. We do so by tending the graves and the memorials of our fallen servicemen and women, buried and memorialized at 26 American cemeteries around the world. We do so also by preserving the stories, the stories of their deeds and the endeavors of those that fought at their side. Courageous, courageous actions, actions that, that bequeath, bequeath the blessings, blessings of freedom, freedom to generations, generations yet unborn. unborn. 75, 75 years ago, <coughs> this very morning, in yards, yards, simply yards, yards from where each of you are sitting, sitting a, generation a generation of young American, American men, joined, joined by French, French British, British, Canadian, and, and other allied actions, nations, nations brothers in arms, did the unthinkable and accomplished the impossible. impossible. These men came ashore and fought against tyranny in a massive undertaking unparalleled in human history. It was Archibald MacLeish, the World War I veteran, who wrote these words in his poem, The Young Dead Soldiers. They say we were young, we have died, remember us. They say we leave you our deaths, give them their meaning. So, so many, many gave us their deaths. deaths. It, it is, is for us, our children, children, for generations to come, to give them their meaning. meaning. So, so our, our presence here today in this beautiful and inspirational cemetery does just that. For the very character of a country can be determined by the way it takes care of its war dead and is a measure of its very heart and soul. To the more than 9,000 Americans who sleep here silently, we give our promise, we will not forget. Each year that we gather here and everywhere they fought and fell, our still grateful hearts are filled by what they did 75 years ago this morning. We shall remember you as when you were reverently, lovingly placed in this hallowed ground. To them and to the World War II veterans with us here today and in spirit around the world, your service, your sacrifice will have meaning so long as those who follow you hold high the torch of freedom that you kept burning through history's darkest hours. Strengthened by their courage, heartened by their valor, 
borne by their memory, let us continue to stand for the ideals for which they live and die. And so today I welcome you as we pause for a brief moment to remember and to rededicate our efforts to the promise of our commission's first chairman, General the Army's John J. Pershing, that time will not dim the glory of their deeds. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the Republic of France, Emmanuel Macron. Mesdames et Messieurs, Monsieur Emmanuel Macron, President de la République Française. Monsieur le Président des États-Unis d'Amérique, cher Donald Trump, dear Donald Trump, Messieurs les combattants du débarquement, chers vétérans, all dear veterans, Mesdames, Messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, cette nuit, du 5 au 6 juin 1944, la Manche n'était pas seulement troublée par la brume naissante, there was not par la houle soutenue qui agitait les flots salés. Depuis quelques heures, en effet, in, hours, depuis que le général Eisenhower avait general lancé son fameux Let's Go, had launched his famous Let's ce sont 1 200 bâtiments de guerre, 5 700 navires de transport contenant canons et camions, chars et barges d'assaut qui gagnaient, précédés de 25 flottilles, 25 au sud de l'île de White, on the Isle of White, en ce point baptisé par l'état-major de l'opération Overlord, in this, in this battle named Overlord, devant les dizaines de milliers de soldats qui avaient ainsi pris la mer, in front of the tens of thousands of soldiers at the sea, rien d'autre que l'immensité noire, nothing else but an immense darkness, Barely lit navires, by the lights of the boats et par la pleine lune. and by the full moon. Devant ces soldats surtout, In front of these soldiers, above all, de the anguish of the unknown. Quelques heures plus tôt, ils avaient appris l'objectif de leur mission. Several hours earlier, they learned Mais leur the goal of their mission. Utah, Omaha, Juno, their Gold, destination, Beach, Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, Sword Beaches. Seuls ceux qui avaient participé quelques mois plus tôt au débarquement de Sicile pressentaient peut-être ce qui les attendait alors, un combat âpre, difficile, a difficult battle, à coup sûr sanglant. A bloody battle. Ces milliers de soldats, donc, thousands of soldiers, conscrits, engagés volontaires, voluntarily avaient pour la plupart une were vingtaine d'années. Perhaps 20 pourtant, years old for the most part. Ils semblaient déjà loin, les jours heureux de leur jeunesse. Far away their youth. Loin, les plaines vallonnées de Pennsylvanie, du Kentucky ou de New Jersey. Far away the loin, les années d'études où ils Kentucky, apprirent un métier qu'ils n'eurent parfois jamais l'occasion d'exercer. Loin, les entraînements exigeants home. commencés sur les monts de Géorgie et poursuivis à mesure que l'opération Bolero les conduisait à traverser l'Atlantique au sud de l'Angleterre. Loin took them to tr cross the Atlantic, waiting for an operation loin, of which they knew nothing, far away from leur départ, the worried loin, looks of their parents, les au revoir déchirants de leur fiancé, the wrenching goodbyes tant of their loved ones, their fiancés, les côtes anglaises leur avaient écrit leaving the English coats, une ultime lettre poignante. An, an ultimate, uh, poignant letter. À quoi songer durant ces heures What were they thinking ces during these hours, par le froid des nuits these du Nord. young people frozen by the northern sait. sea? Nobody knows. Ne Nobody can penetrate the, the Mais ce qui thickness of such a moment. Après. 75 le years later, inouï. what strikes us La is the unbelievable courage and generosity il y eut durant ces heures-là comme une force qui allait et qui portait chacun vers son destin. What happened during that evening that brought qui les conduisit là à des milliers de kilomètres de chez eux pour porter secours à des femmes et des hommes qu'ils ne connaissaient pas pour libérer une terre 
qui ne l'était pour la plupart jamais foulée, sans autre boussole qu'une cause qu'ils savaient plus importante que a cause that they believe to be more important than themselves, celle de la that of freedom, that of democracy. Alors so today, la France, pas. France does not forget. La France, pas tous ces France à qui doesn't doit de forget vivre libre. all those veterans to whom la we France owe freedom. Pas. France does not forget the 135,000 soldiers, British, uh, Canadian, uh, Lux Luxembourgian, uh, Norwegian, uh, Polish, uh, South African and French who, who landed on the beaches of Normandy and um, La France determined pas. the future of Europe. De France does not forget tôt, the millions of thousands of parachutists who landed and became part réponse of the interior resistance, les routes, les voies ferrées, who became relais uh, for vivant, their brothers in arms. La France n'oublie pas France does not forget de the two million soldiers qui, ce jour le plus long, that enfin on expiré, that longest day spent weeks to liberate the towns of Bocage, plus meurtrière encore que celle des plages. Even bloodier than Alors, au nom de the France, beaches. Au nom de notre nation, In the name of our nation, je m'incline ce jour devant leur bravoure. I, I kneel Je before their bravery, the immense, their immense sacrifice, tués, 19 the 19,000 disappeared, entre juin et août the heroes of the Normandy, et pour la plupart, pour most of whom are resting Je for eternity. Et à nos et à leur I bow Je dis to merci. the veterans and to their nation. I say thank you. We know you. what we owe to you, veterans, our freedom. On behalf of my nation, I just want to say thank you. Nombre d'entre eux nous font face oh. dans ce cimetière d'ego mort Number, pour notre liberté. Numerous are they who Vos are across from us in the cemetery. Ce que, cher Vincent Hines, Vincent Hines, vous avez tenté de sauver. You tried to save. Vous qui vous êtes porté volontaire. You who voluntarily inscribed to be part of the second wave on juin, Omaha and who on the 6th of June took every risk to get wounded from the beach, even though the intensity of the battle was Ceux at a maximal qui, level. Cher Paul Worth, Paul Worth vous avez combattu you, depuis cette même plage you fought on the same beach in Omaha de Bastogne, until all the way to Bastogne, including the battle that liberated Brittany, brothers in arms. Ceux qui, cher Charles Juro, Charles Jorot, you accompanied in the, in the hell of Normandy, you who fought and le 7 juin without le 8 juillet, fail, et qui pour certains vous ont suivi dans les Ardennes, and, au and, and et followed dans la into the Ardennes and Luxembourg and Czechoslovakia, qui, cher Stanley Friday, Stanley Friday, vous ont secouru. Vous qui avez été blessé à you deux who reprises were wounded twice, puis were dans les Ardennes, in the uh, region of Saint Lou and then in the Ardennes, what gave you the strength to continue fighting all the way to the liberation of the concentration camps and see the faces of the Alors survivors? 
dans la vérité crue de ce moment. In the, what did you understand in the raw truth of that moment? Frères d'armes à vous aussi. What they went through. Cher Harold Terence. Harold Terence. Radio, you who were originally a radio operator and who decided de le sol de France pour mener des opérations militaires to en come Normandie, to France Arins, to Annecy, lead military operations in Normandy, in Reims, in Annecy. Cher Vincent Hines. Cher Vincent Paul Verf, Hines, Paul Wirth, cher Charles Jouro, Charles Jouro, cher Stanley Friday, Stanley Friday, cher Harold Terence, Harold Terence, en reconnaissance de votre engagement in, infaillible, in recognition pour que la France of your sa liberté, incredible contribution, que vous ferez dans quelques instants, uh, in, chevalier, in helping dans France national to find freedom, I will bestow upon you in a few minutes the Legion of Honor. Cette distinction, This distinction, la plus élevée que délivre la République française, vient bien sûr saluer vos actes exceptionnels, delivers, votre courage, votre contribution à la libération de notre pays. C'est aussi pour la nation française. 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 Dear Mr. Trump, qui jamais aussi grande, which has never been se bat pour la liberté des autres. bigger than when it fights for the freedom of others, qui jamais aussi grande que lorsqu'elle se montre fidèle aux valeurs universelles que défendaient when ses pères fondateurs, lorsqu'il y a près de deux siècles et demi, la France va soutenir son indépendance. France will support Mais nous vous devons plus. your independence, but we owe you more. Mais nous vous devons plus. Nous vous devons, we owe you messieurs. More. We owe you. Nous devons à tous ceux qui se sont battus, Sirs, all aux of milliers you who de fought, civils qui sont tombés et que je n'oublie pas, the, all the plus que des médailles et that, plus que des that, mots. That, that don't nous devons nous montrer dignes de l'héritage de paix que nous words, uh, avons en héritage. Uh, we owe you the dignity that you have dette, um, digne de la promesse de Normandie. The, et être digne de la promesse de Normandie, c'est ne jamais oublier que les Normandy. peuples libres, lorsqu'ils s'unissent, Normandy will never be forgotten. La victoire contre la barbarie aurait the, été impossible sans l'apport décisif des États-Unis d'Amérique, sans les millions d'hommes et de femmes America, engagés, sans the, la mobilisation the, de l'appareil industriel et de toute la population américaine. Et sur les plages de la Manche, dans le vert bocage normand, comme au plus haut niveau des États-majors, il y a une union, l'union toujours, a union, des armées alliées. Always a union of the allied forces. Because the Royal Air Force, prête à main forte à l'infanterie canadienne, parce que la résistance française sut ouvrir en Normandie, en Bretagne et ailleurs la voie à l'armée américaine. And open the path to the American forces. It's because in the moments decisive of the battle, the American forces, 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 the American forces. Parce que dans l'enlisement de la bataille de la poche de la falaise, les blindés polonais firent la différence. Que ce pari fou de faire libérer l'Europe du joug nazi par la mer of, pu être uh, liberating Europe from the Nazis donc, oui, by way of nous ne devons water, jamais cesser de faire vivre uh, l'alliance des peuples libres. Uh, um, c'est ce que firent les vainqueurs alive, this, uh, dès le lendemain de la, de, la de la capitulation allemande. From the surrender of, of, of the Germans and the Japanese to the creation of the United Nations, du traité de Nord. Uh, the uh, establishment of the NATO Treaty, plus tard, or les dirigeants de ce continent, the leaders of this continent, making the European Union. Cette promesse de Normandie. This promise of Normandy. Nous devons en retrouver le sel. We need to find saisir à nouveau les raisons de cet engagement. The, the root, the, Ce the reason for this engagement. Ce qu'on doit à l'alliance des pays What qui partagent les mêmes valeurs. To the alliance de la of countries that share the same values, those of democracy and freedom. La leçon de Colville-sur-Mer. The lesson of Colville-sur-Mer. C'est que ces deux raisons. 
is that those sont inséparables. Two reasons are inseparable. Ces jeunes Américains sont morts. The, those young Americans are, are dead here pour leur pays and died here for their country et pour la liberté du monde and for the ensemble. freedom of the world Ils le together. They knew it. Et les Français qui sont morts sur les mêmes and, plages and the à leur côté died alongside them on the same beaches fell for the liberation of their country. They also fell so that their nation would research in its tradition of liberty. Being faithful to their memory is to never separate what their sacrifices united. This promise of Normandy. La France continuera de la porter de France toutes ses continues forces. to Jean hold it with serment. all of its strength. Et elle est au cœur it is at the heart de la destinée américaine véritable. The true American destiny. Monsieur le président des États-Unis d'Amérique. Mesdames et messieurs. Mr. President le long of the des routes de France, States, des plages du Cotentin à Cherbourg, de Cherbourg à Avranches, d'Avranches à Metz, de Metz à Bastogne, sur tous ces chemins. And que les héros que nous célébrons aujourd'hui ont emprunté à partir de l'été 44, in on trouve 1944, des centaines de bornes ornées des étoiles du drapeau américain, uh, et de la flamme, flags, de cette statue de la liberté qu'un jour flames, un de nos plus grands sculpteurs offrit à la ville de New York. The lights, just Pierre, like the Statue of Liberty, which our uh, greatest sculpture would give Comme to the United States, indélébile. like the unforgettable de uh, memory de ce que notre pays of doit what à our country owes to Leur America. Présence. Aussi comme une à renouveler uh, sans reason cesse. also ce pacte séculaire unissant la France, this l'Amérique, the the et pact, la liberté. Uh, joining France and America prêt, and freedom, des I am I'm ready. Cher Donald Trump, uh, le peuple de France y est prêt. Mr. President, Donald Trump, the people of France, we are, we are l'histoire ready des to, to live this history of uh, friendship and in the current day. Nous sommes prêts. We are ready, we remain ready, et nous le ferons. and we will do it. Alors, merci. Thank you. Vive les États-Unis d'Amérique. Long live the United vive States of America. Long live the vive Republic. La France. Long live Et France. Vive entre nos donations. And long live the friendship between our two nations. Ladies and gentlemen, President Macron will now present the Legion of Honor to five of our World War II veterans. Mesdames et Messieurs, le Président de la République Emmanuel Macron va maintenant présenter la Légion d'honneur à cinq vétérans de la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Monsieur Vincent Hines, au nom de la République française, nous vous faisons chevalier de la Légion d'honneur. Monsieur Stanley Friday, Stanley Friday, au nom de la République française, nous vous faisons chevalier de la Légion d'honneur.
Monsieur Charles Jouro, au nom de la République française, nous vous faisons chevalier de la Légion d'honneur. Monsieur Harold Terence, au nom de la République française, nous vous faisons chevalier de la Légion d'honneur. Monsieur Paul Wirth, Paul Wirth, Wirth, au nom de la République française, in the name of the French Republic, nous vous faisons chevalier we de la Légion d'honneur. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the President of the United States, States Donald Trump. Mesdames et Messieurs, Monsieur Donald J. Trump, President des états unis President Macron, Mrs. Macron, and the people of France, to the First Lady of the United States and members of the United States Congress, to distinguished guests, veterans, and my fellow Americans, we are gathered here on Freedom's Altar on these shores, on these bluffs, on this day 75 years ago. 10,000 men shed their blood and thousands sacrificed their lives for their brothers, for their countries, and for the survival of liberty. Today, we remember those who fell, and we honor all who fought right here in Normandy. They won back this ground for civilization to more than 170 veterans of the Second World War who join us today. You are among the very greatest Americans who will ever live. You are the pride of our nation. You are the glory of our republic. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts.
Here with you are over 60 veterans who landed on D-Day. Our debt to you is everlasting. Today, we express our undying gratitude. When you were young, these men enlisted their lives in a great crusade, one of the greatest of all times. Their mission is the story of an epic battle and the ferocious, eternal struggle between good and evil. On the 6th of June, 1944, they joined a liberation force of awesome power and breathtaking scale. After months of planning, the Allies had chosen this ancient coastline to mount their campaign to vanquish the wicked tyranny of the Nazi Empire from the face of the Earth. The battle began in the skies above us. In those first tense midnight hours, 1,000 aircraft roared overhead, with 17,000 Allied airborne troops preparing to leap into the darkness beyond these trees. Then came dawn. The enemy who had occupied these heights saw the largest naval armada in the history of the world. Just a few miles offshore were 7,000 vessels bearing 130,000 warriors. They were the citizens of free and independent nations united by their duty to their compatriots and to millions yet unborn. There were the British, whose nobility and fortitude saw them through the worst of Dunkirk and the London Blitz. The full violence of Nazi fury was no match for the full grandeur of British pride. Thank you. There were the Canadians, whose robust sense of honor and loyalty compelled them to take up arms alongside Britain from the very, very beginning. There were the fighting Poles, the tough Norwegians, and the intrepid Aussies. There were the gallant French commandos, soon to be met by thousands of their brave countrymen ready to write a new chapter in the long history of French valor. And finally, there were the Americans. They came from the farms of a vast heartland, the streets of glowing cities and the forges of mighty industrial towns. Before the war, many had never ventured beyond their own community. Now they had come to offer their lives half a world from home. This beach, codenamed Omaha, was defended by the Nazis with monstrous firepower, thousands and thousands of mines and spikes driven into the sand so deeply. It was here that tens of thousands of the Americans came. The GIs who boarded the landing craft that morning knew that they carried on their shoulders not just the pack of a soldier, but the fate of the world. Colonel George Taylor, whose 16th Infantry Regiment would join in the first wave, was asked what would happen if the Germans stopped right then and there, cold on the beach, just stopped them. What would happen? This great American replied, why, the 18th Infantry is coming in right behind us. The 26th Infantry will come on, too. Then there is the 2nd Infantry Division, already afloat. 
and the ninth division, and the second armored, and the third armored, and all the rest. Maybe the 16th won't make it, but someone will. One of those men in Taylor's 16th Regiment was Army medic Ray Lambert. Ray was only 23, but he had already earned three Purple Hearts and two Silver Stars fighting in North Africa and Sicily, where he and his brother Bill, no longer with us, served side by side. In the early morning hours, the two brothers stood together on the deck of the USS Enrico before boarding two separate Higgins landing craft. If I don't make it, Bill said, please, please take care of my family. Ray asked his brother to do the same. Of the 31 men on Ray's landing craft, only Ray and six others made it to the beach. There were only a few of them left. They came to the sector right here below us. Easy Red, it was called. Again and again, Ray ran back into the water. He dragged out one man after another. He was shot through the arm. His leg was ripped open by shrapnel. His back was broken. He nearly drowned. He had been on the beach for hours, bleeding and saving lives, when he finally lost consciousness. He woke up the next day on a cot beside another badly wounded soldier. He looked over and saw his brother Bill. They made it. They made it. They made it. At 98 years old, Ray is here with us today with his fourth Purple Heart and his third Silver Star from Omaha. Ray, the free world salutes you. Nearly two hours in, unrelenting fire from these bluffs kept the Americans pinned down on the sand, now red with our hero's blood. Then, just a few hundred yards from where I'm standing, a breakthrough came. The battle turned, and with it, history. Down on the beach, Captain Joe Dawson, the son of a Texas preacher led Company G through a minefield to a natural fold in the hillside, still here. Just beyond this path, to my right, Captain Dawson snuck beneath an enemy machine gun perch and tossed his grenades. Soon, American troops were charging up Dawson's draw. What a job he did. What bravery he showed. 
Lieutenant Spaulding and the men from Company E moved on to crush the enemy's strong point on the far side of this cemetery and stop the slaughter on the beach below. Countless more Americans poured out across this ground all over the countryside. They joined fellow American warriors from Utah Beach and allies from Juneau, sword and gold, along with the Airborne and the French Patriots. Private First Class Russell Pickett of the 29th Division's famed 116th Infantry Regiment had been wounded in the first wave that landed on Omaha Beach. At a hospital in England, Private Pickett vowed to return to battle. I'm going to return, he said. I'm going to return. Six days after D-Day, he rejoined his company. Two-thirds had been killed already. Many had been wounded within 15 minutes of the invasion. They lost 19 just from the small town of Bedford, Virginia, alone. Before long, a grenade left Private Pickett, and he was gravely wounded, so badly wounded. Again, he chose to return. He didn't care. He had to be here. He was then wounded a third time and laid unconscious for 12 days. They thought he was gone. They thought he had no chance. Russell Pickett is the last known survivor of the legendary Company A. And today, believe it or not, he has returned once more to these shores to be with his comrades. Private Pickett, you honor us all with your presence. By the fourth week of August, Paris was liberated. Some who landed here pushed all the way to the center of Germany. Some threw open the gates of Nazi concentration camps to liberate Jews who had suffered the bottomless horrors of the Holocaust. And some warriors fell on other fields of battle, returning to rest on this soil for eternity. Before this place was consecrated to history, the land was owned by a French farmer, a member of the French resistance. These were great people. These were strong and tough people. His terrified wife waited out D-Day in a nearby house, holding tight to their little baby girl. The next day, a soldier appeared. I'm an American, he said. I'm here to help. The French woman was overcome with emotion and cried. Days later, she laid flowers on fresh American graves. Today, her granddaughter, Stephanie, serves as a guide at this cemetery. This week, Stephanie led 92-year-old Marion Wynn of California 
to see the grave of her brother Don for the very first time. Marion and Stephanie are both with us today, and we thank you for keeping alive the memories of our precious heroes. Thank you. Nine thousand three hundred and eighty eight young Americans rest beneath the white crosses and stars of David arrayed on these beautiful grounds. Each one has been adopted by a French family that thinks of him as their own. They come from all over France to look after our boys. They kneel, they cry, they pray, they place flowers, and they never forget. Today, America embraces the French people and thanks you for honoring our beloved dead. Thank you. To all of our friends and partners, our cherished alliance was forged in the heat of battle, tested in the trials of war, and proven in the blessings of peace. Our bond is unbreakable. From across the earth, Americans are drawn to this place as though it were a part of our very soul. We come not only because of what they did here, we come because of who they were. They were young men with their entire lives before them. They were husbands who said goodbye to their young brides and took their duty as their fate. They were fathers who would never meet their infant sons and daughters because they had a job to do. And with God as their witness, they were going to get it done. They came wave after wave without question, without hesitation, and without complaint. More powerful than the strength of American arms was the strength of American hearts. These men ran through the fires of hell, moved by a force no weapon could destroy. The fierce patriotism of a free, proud, and sovereign people. They battled not for control and domination, but for liberty, democracy, and self-rule. They pressed on for love and home and country, the main streets, the schoolyards, the churches, and neighbors, the families, and communities that gave us men such as these. They were sustained by the confidence that America can do anything because we are a noble nation with a virtuous people praying to a righteous God. 
the exceptional might came from a truly exceptional spirit. The abundance of courage came from an abundance of faith. The great deeds of an army came from the great depths of their love. As they confronted their fate, the Americans and the Allies placed themselves into the palm of God's hand. The men behind me will tell you that they are just the lucky ones. As one of them recently put it, all the heroes are buried here. But we know what these men did. We knew how brave they were. They came here and saved freedom. And then they went home and showed us all what freedom is all about. The American sons and daughters who saw us to victory were no less extraordinary in peace. They built families. They built industries. They built a national culture that inspired the entire world. In the decades that followed, America defeated communism, secured civil rights, revolutionized science, launched a man to the moon, and then kept on pushing to new frontiers. And today, America is stronger than ever before. Seven decades ago, the warriors of D-Day fought a sinister enemy who spoke of a thousand-year empire. In defeating that evil, they left a legacy that will last not only for a thousand years, but for all time. For as long as the soul knows of duty and honor, for as long as freedom keeps its hold on the human heart. To the men who sit behind me and to the boys who rest in the field before me, your example will never, ever grow old. Your legend will never die. Your spirit, brave, unyielding, and true, will never die. The blood that they spilled, the tears that they shed, the lives that they gave, the sacrifice that they made, did not just win a battle. It did not just win a war. Those who fought here won a future for our nation. They won the survival of our civilization. And they showed us the way to love, cherish, and defend our way of life for many centuries to come. Today, as we stand together upon this sacred Earth, we pledge that our nation will forever be strong and united. We will forever be together. Our people will forever be bold. Our hearts will forever be loyal. And our children and their children will forever and always be free. May God bless our great veterans. May God bless our allies. May God bless the heroes of D-Day. And may God bless America. Thank you. Thank you very much.
States, the President of France, and the President of the United States, will lay a wreath in their memories, followed by a moment of silence. En l'honneur et en la mémoire de ceux qui ont consenti l'ultime sacrifice au service de la France et des États-Unis, le président de la République française et le président des États-Unis vont maintenant déposer une gerbe, puis observer un moment de silence. as Presidents Macron and President Trump greet the World War II veterans.
President Trump and President Macron greeting veterans there in the front rows of the ceremony honoring the 75th anniversary of D-Day. The president said, you are the pride of our nation and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. He went on to say the exceptional might came from an exceptional spirit. The abundance of courage came from an abundance of faith. The great deeds of our army came from the great depths of their love. And President Macron bestowed the Legion of Honor on five veterans and said 75 years later, it's a way of saying that we know what we owe America. Rob Satina, what an extraordinary moment it must have been for all those veterans. Absolutely. Two presidents turning to them, shaking, it appears, all, virtually all of their hands. Absolutely. You can see it in their faces. You can see it in the faces of those who are with them. All the veterans come with a companion, of course, given their advanced age. And you can see how much it meant to the family members and companions as well. As President Macron said, the Legion of Honor is, uh, is the nation's highest honor in France. It's a version of nobility that you're not born into. It's something you earn through your deeds, and I think that's the meaning of this moment. Right. From here, the two presidents uh, will take a, will leave the stage area and will walk towards Omaha Beach, the overlook on Omaha Beach, uh, where there will be a 21-gun salute. Um, there will also be flyovers, uh, and the ceremony will end with the playing of taps. But as you see, uh, the two presidents are lingering uh, amongst the veterans at this moment. It's not a moment to rush. Well, no. Something to savor. They've waited a long time for this. <laughs> it must be quite extraordinary to receive a Legion of Honor 75 years after you were on on the beaches here in Normandy. The two presidents seem to be savoring it as well. Yeah, they sure do. They seem to be in no hurry. And we said there are, as we said, it looks, uh, there are about, I think about 60, 65 um, D-Day veterans um, who are here. There are some additional World War II veterans. Um, but considering the age of most of them now, that's a quite a strong contingent. Once again, if you consider that 3% of those who put the uniform on are still alive, and look at 75,000 U.S. troops at D-Day, there's perhaps only a couple thousand D-Day veterans left in the country. Yeah, and some of them are remarkably spry, uh, as we've seen, still managing their way around the cemetery and the beaches to come back and take a look. A lot of them here with their families. Um, some have brought their sons and their grandchildren. Um, as you pointed out, it's, a, it's something that they want, to sh want their family to understand. The National World War II Museum has been traveling with some of these veterans over the last uh, week to 10 days, and spry is the word. Where, where have you been taking them? So um, we looked at the entire war in Western Europe from Amsterdam on yeah. the way. We convened in Amsterdam and then sailed down the coast into the channel. We were in all fleur. Uh, yesterday and a couple days on the extreme other side of this Normandy beachhead and today we uh, drove in from Cherbourg on the extreme western side. Mm -hmm. We had a veterans panel a couple nights ago in which I moderated, uh, you know, asked them a few questions and they were cutting up like 18 year olds. Uh, the energy level in the room amongst the veterans and amongst the, the, the viewers, the, the audience as well was really something to behold. Well, and from what from what I've seen, uh, Mark uh, Mark Phillips in the in the last few days is is as soon as you get the veterans near any of these uh, you know landmarks, a, a remarkable energy surge occurs. <laughs> uh, it can be pretty tough to keep up with them, and <clears throat> not quite as quick, I suppose, as they moved uh, 75 years ago, but still uh, still commendable. Uh, it's really fascinating to have watched the exchanges uh, between. President Trump and the veterans, uh, especially the ones who singled out, he singled out a half dozen or so. Uh, different uh, stories of heroism uh, of veterans who managed to make it here for this event. Uh, he went over and he 
shook their hands and embraced them. And in many cases, they, uh, they embraced uh, him back. It was uh, a bit of a mutual admiration moment, uh, I think, on, be on behalf of, uh, of both of them. Mm -hmm. um, and some uh, memories for them. You know, what can we say about <laughs> his, his performance here? He, um, he, he seems to have done what presidents are meant to do on occasions like this. Yeah. Uh, and the veterans seem to appreciate it. As you see, there are still some people wandering through the cemetery and taking it in as this ceremony continues. I look at the cemetery and I think about the best of America, officers and enlisted men laying side by side, no distinction as to rank, yeah. uh, all equal in depth. It is one of the most stunning places in the world I've ever been. I've been to a lot of places. There's, Every time you come here, it really takes your breath away. The There's a serenity about it, I, yeah. I guess for lack of a better word. There is a serenity about it. You feel a, a calmness, like these souls are at rest, uh, a, a job to be done, as we've heard repeatedly, and a, and a job done. Yeah. Also immaculately maintained. Yes, is, which is which is a... <laughs> Every time I come here, I, in fact, I've asked gardeners here, how do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's always impeccable. It's always, as actually, as, as virtually every American military yeah. cemetery that I've been to. Uh, Rob, you were saying they do they do an amazing job. Thank yeah. the ABMC, American Battle for the Monuments Commission. This yeah. is their biggest task. Yeah. It's a beautiful uh, a cemetery uh, outside of Anzio in, in Italy. So for the fallen of the Italian campaign, that, that is also extremely lovely. Something else every American should see at some point in their lives. Yeah. I was talking to the, uh, the guy, the director who runs this place, uh, named Scott Desjardins. He's, uh, has worked for the monuments. Uh, what an appropriate name, by the way, Desjardins, yeah. of the gardens <laughs> in French. Right. You can't make that up. <laughs> no, you can't. Um, and I was surprised to learn this is, in fact, not the largest American war cemetery uh, in Europe. There's one in Belgium, I believe. That's bigger, is it? That's actually wow. That's bigger, but I me. think it also includes casualties from the First World War. Yeah. Um, but it is a, a testament to that uh, transatlantic uh, alliance that was referred to by both presidents today. Yes. The two presidents, as you can see now, preparing uh, to make the walk uh, towards Omaha Beach, the overlook uh, here. It's very difficult, actually, to get down to the beach from here, which was part of the problem on D-Day, Rob, wasn't it? That's one another reason why this, this cemetery is perfect. It lays out the military problem. Mm. The men are lying here on the bluffs that were overlooking them in the course of the day. Their objective. This is where they were trying to get. And yeah. they, they, they came, and they, they made it, they sacrificed, and now they rest on it. It's, uh, it is a very short trip from the memorial. Uh, to the overlook of Omaha Beach. An another location here that w when you see it and, and you try to understand what happened here 75 years ago, you, it's, just, it's, uh, it's just a phenomenal achievement. Often you visit a battle site and it's an open field. And yeah. Someone points out the enemy was there, the enemy was here. This is different. 21 gun salute. The completion of the 21-gun salute on this very moving ceremony. Rob Satino, historian with the World War II Museum, what's your sense of this day? I was overwhelmed. I was here five years ago for the 70th, and this was even more beautiful and more moving. The poignancy of the veterans did it for me.
Mark Phillips, one last word. A lot of uh, people were looking at this ceremony to see uh, how the president, uh, president of the United States uh, would perform, and the Europeans were looking very much for it to see uh, what he would say, and I think uh, everyone will come away pretty satisfied. All right. Mark Phillips, Rob Satino, thank you both very much, and to Paula Reed as well. Thank you. Our D-Day anniversary coverage will continue throughout the day on our 24-hour streaming network, CBSN. You can watch it at cbsnews.com or through our CBS News app. There will be much more ahead on this CBS station and on CBS This Morning. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm Anthony Mason, CBS News, Normandy, France. It's 24 hours a day. Go to cbsnews.com. Good morning, everyone. You've been watching a CBS News special report on the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Events continue to unfold commemorating uh, that glorious and also tragic battle. We're going to take you back to the shores of France to continue our coverage.
So we've been uh, watching the ceremonies, observing the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And what's occurring right now is a series of flyovers. What you're seeing right now is a one USC 130. Right prior to that were four French fighters uh, in the missing man formation. The uh, French president and uh, the uh, American president, Donald Trump, are standing near the Omaha Beach Overlook. They had spoken briefly with the superintendent of the Normandy American Cemetery, and now they'll be observing a series of flyovers. You know, you're looking at sort of this grassy hill right now, but, you know, go back 75 years. This is the area where... Uh, Tens of, thousands, tens of thousands of soldiers um, landed and began to make their way towards land. It's rolling and lush now, but it would have been pockmarked uh, so many years ago. And now this flyover, eight U.S. C-30s. Um, well, actually, it looks like a lot more than eight USC 30s uh, for what we're looking at here. So looking at sort of some guidance that we've received. Um, this will go on probably for another half hour or so. It started today with uh, speeches and songs. We heard from Emmanuel Macron. We heard from President Donald Trump. And on stage with them, along with the dignitaries, once again, World War II veterans, men who perhaps the last time they saw this landscape, it was with their brothers in arms, uh, scurrying, fighting for their lives, fighting for what they believed in. Uh, it's a much, much different scene now. Uh, we're talking about men who are in their 90s, some of them nearing 100 or over 100 years old, but managed to make their way uh, to Normandy for this anniversary.